Welcome, good afternoon, all the delegates. Welcome to everybody who's uh, looking at us from all the corners, from all over the globe. There are thousands of them connected with us this afternoon. Welcome to the Italian Prime Minister, Mario Draghi, accompanied by Deputy Secretary General of United Nations, Amina Mohammed. Welcome in the room. Welcome, benvenuti. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure trying to make sense out of this long afternoon together. It's a pre-summit that is meant to find a way towards action. We're not just gonna discuss things, we're going to frame actions. We're living through a difficult time. We're living through a pandemic, being in the middle of a pandemic could be something that prevents us from acting. Not so, exactly the opposite. Being in the time of a pandemic means we have the chance to rethink our life, our lifestyle, our project, our way of shaping politics, intergenerational discussions, and this is exactly what is meant to be in this pre-summit. Framing the future we want to achieve. So, first of all, let me welcome our host, the host of our venue here, Chu Yung Wu, who is the Director General of uh, Food and Agriculture Organization. Please have the floor. Your Excellencies, dear Professor Draghi, President of the Council of the Minister Italy, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I welcome all participants, both present at FU headquarters in Rome and attend virtually to the UN Food System pre-summit. We are at the critical moment in time. Before the pandemic, we already knew that we were off track to achieve the sustainable development goals. Our agro-food systems are not developing properly, and in many parts of the world, their systems were not efficient, inclusive, and sustainable. The pandemic aggravated the situation. The historic task we're facing is clear defining holistic, coordinated approach to transform our agro-food system, turning the tide, accelerate the progress towards SDG. To achieve this ambitious transformation, we needed to change the policy, mindset, and the business model. At FO, we have implemented several fundamental transformative actions over the past two years to drive this change. For an innovative, efficient, inclusive organization, that is the feed for the purpose. Our new strategy framework for the next decade, focusing on the transformation to more efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life, leaving no one behind. We are translating our aspiration into concrete action through enormous activities and initiatives. FAO's flagship matchmaking hand in hand initiatives aims to accelerate agricultural transformation. Initiatives like the Food Coalition joined with the Italian government and the COVID-19 response and recovery program complement our holistic approach. We design different package of solutions for each member countries and for each commodities. Solutions that include establishing enabling and coherent policy, investing in agri-food systems and infrastructure promoting R&D, encourage science and innovation, addressing the rural able gaps of inequality. FAO continue to build and strengthen joint efforts across the sector, regions, and the communities with all stakeholders. Together, in solidarity, effectiveness, and determination, we invite all of you to join us in this historical defined noble mission, from the people, by the people, and for the people 
towards the bright future for all humankind. When it comes to the future, the future of agri-food system belongs to the young people of today. Shortly after taking office in 2019, I launched the FAO Youth Committee and the Women's Committee in the history, first time, to increase the youth engagement and women's empower, first their innovative spark. And they are reach out to major youth groups from all over the world with the launch of World Food Forum, WFF. I invite you all to join the WFF first week of October this year. We must see this opportunity to uplift the, your, our youth, taking the world from zero waste first to zero hunger final. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Director General. But let me just say that what is happening these days in Rome, what is happening this afternoon, is not coming out of the blue. It's uh, the result of a long process, of a process that involved many of you, many of you in the room, many of those people connecting with us from uh, the globe, and uh, uh, we feel them here and close to us, but this is what pandemic forces us to do, and uh, a long journey that is, uh, uh, has been an exercise of leadership. But uh, let's use this video to see this journey that will take us all to the summit in New York. Transforming food systems is crucial for delivering all the sustainable development goals. That is why I hope to convene a food system summit in 2021 as part of the decade of action to deliver the sustainable development goals. The onset of COVID-19 has, in just nine months, reversed the gains that were achieved in the last decade. But the pandemic also shows us that change is possible. The one silver lining from the COVID-19 pandemic that it has made people and governments realize that we cannot be living in the way we do. Food systems are one of the most powerful links between humans and the planet. To achieve resilience in terms of food system, we need to take up a holistic approach. This Food System Summit Dialogue aim to broaden understanding and allow everyone to mobilize new coalitions, partnerships and alliances around concrete solutions. You don't need an invitation. You can take part from the comfort of your own home, no matter who you are. And I think that's the beauty of the Food System Summit. To deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals, transforming our global food systems is arguably one of our biggest hopes when it comes to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. But in recent times, our people are opting more for processed foods, but they lack nutrition. That leads to far higher long-term costs like obesity. Young people self-organizing, taking initiative, and mobilizing to create non-violent social movements that create change. Y ahora más que nunca debemos acelerar los compromisos. Nosotros estamos comprometidos cuando hablamos de la transformación profunda de la alimentación. It's very critical to see how as indigenous peoples we can change the Narrative. Food is the coolest thing in the whole world. All of you can change the world every time you eat. Hello. Now people are starting to understand that I can cultivate these green spaces. They have the time to do that. And they're starting to see it as a viable option for their careers. Nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. Part of the process of taking these actions forward is actually building accountability mechanisms to ensure that we get to solutions and we get to change. The solutions and enthusiasm we have shared with us since 2019 have given us a bold action plan for a more sustainable future. We have the ability to create a more sustainable food system through a focus on the power of beauty, the value of hospitality, and the quality of the ideas. We have so many ideas, and the historic summit is just weeks away. I'm asking you, let's seize this moment and build a better future together. richness of voices and this is very useful to understand why food which is a sort of a connective tissue that uh, links uh, people planet prosperity is really our 
tool to reach a sustainable future. But uh, exactly for this, let me give the floor to the Secretary General of uh, United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Let's listen to his message. Antonio Guterres, His Excellency Mario Draghi, Prime Minister of Italy, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, New Zealand Bulabinaka. Fiji is grateful for this opportunity and is happy to participate in this forum to highlight the status of Fiji's food system in response to the triple challenge of meeting food, climate change, and biodiversity goals. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, food availability in Fiji is generally with me that uh, there was a technical problem on this, but let's wait for the right message. Okay, uh, we will listen to that just afterwards, but uh, it's obviously uh, that it's obvious that one of the key issues here is uh, the future of people and planet. So uh, this is what Secretary General normally reminds us, that uh, what is at stake is what we have to do to get back on track to meet the goals for 2030. Uh, if we have the right video, please let me know. If it's not happening, uh, let me just add something different, because in this very moment, uh, the world could ask no other leader than Prime Minister Draghi to set the bar high on what has to be done, especially because Italy has been as a long record of leadership on uh, food agenda and Italy in this very moment is playing a key role in G20. So Prime Minister Draghi, please, the floor is yours. I mean, I was just sitting there watching in partnership with the government of Italy. And just the first thing I want to tell you is how proud I am of this partnership. Thank you. <laughs> Director General, Deputy Secretary General, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you in Rome. Secretary General Gutierrez launched the idea of this summit in October 2019 on World Food Day. He was uh, worried about the many threats to food security, including climate change, infectious diseases, and disruptions to supply chains. The COVID-19 pandemic has made these concerns all the more urgent. The global downturn has pushed millions of people below the poverty line. Uncertain weather conditions and supply disruptions have contributed to soaring food prices. The Agricultural Commodity Price Index has increased by 30% compared to January 2020, and it is near the highest level in eight years. As a result, the plight of malnutrition is spreading. Malnutrition in all its forms has become the leading cause of ill health and death. In 2019, around 690 million people suffered from hunger globally. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization, the pandemic will increase the number of undernourished people by up to 130 million, bringing the total to more than 800 million. The health crisis has led to a food crisis. We've taken commitments to ensure vaccines are available to the world's poorest. We must act just as forcefully in improve access to adequate food supplies. At the end of last year, Italy promoted a food coalition here in this room that was joined by more than 40 countries. The coalition has the objective of achieving food security for all, fighting extreme poverty and food insecurity in the wake of the pandemic. 
We need more funding from governments and development banks to reduce risks for investors in the agricultural sector and improve access to credit, especially for smaller farmers. This is the subject of the Finance in Common Summit that Italy will host in Rome in October. Under the Italian presidency, the G20 has identified the main priorities for improving food security globally. The Matera Declaration signed last month at the Foreign Affairs Minister's meeting, thank you, Mr. Di Maio, emphasized the importance of international trade and climate change adaptation policies. Productivity in agriculture is 21% lower than it would be without climate change. The negative impact of changing rainfall patterns, droughts, and floods is likely to grow exponentially unless we adopt appropriate mitigation and adaptation policies. This will be at the heart of COP26 that Italy co-chairs with the United Kingdom. This autumn in Glasgow, we want to reach an ambitious climate deal that includes both rich and emerging economies. And here, for all of you who know about these issues, ambition is the key word. Combating all forms of malnutrition goes hand in hand with preserving traditional diets and food diversity. Nearly three billion people around the world do not have access to healthy diets. In Sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Asia, almost 60% of the population cannot afford one. We must promote healthy eating habits while preserving traditional food cultures built through the centuries, built through the centuries. Con la dichiarazione di Matera. With the Matera Declaration, the G20, the G20 has paved the way for the Food Systems Summit of September. This pre-summit is the opportunity to transform the way in which we think, we produce, and we consume food globally. I am certain that your proposals will arouse great interest, and I really wish you every success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Ambition is the key word, ambition and the need to act. An action that takes place at different levels, an action that takes place from the local to the global level. This is why it's a pleasure now, thanks to technology, going in connection to uh, Rwanda with the, the president of Rwanda and chair of the African Union Development Agency, Paul Kagame. President. Excellency Mario Draghi, Prime Minister of Italy, Excellencies, the most Yes, President Kagame, we can hear you. Please, you can continue your message. We can hear you perfectly. No speech. Point is, can he listen to us? I first wish to commend Secretary General Guterres and Prime Minister Draghi for convening this pre-summit. The care that has been invested in preparing for the United Nations Food System Summit in September, engaging thousands of stakeholders, reflects the urgency of transforming the world's food systems. Agriculture and agribusiness, especially in Africa, will drive our attainment of the sustainable development goals. This is especially true as we work to make up for the time lost to the COVID pandemic. Each country and region must chart its own pathway to transformation, but this is also a global challenge. 
that we must address together. In Africa, 70% of the world working age population is employed in the agricultural sector. But our continents, food markets are often fragmented and links to food processing and value addition services are sometimes lacking. Digital technologies and biotechnology are playing a greater role in African agriculture, but too many farmers do not yet have reliable access. Financial services and products for farmers, including insurance, are generally inadequate. As a result, Africa's food producers do not earn the level of income that they deserve, and they must cope with high levels of economic risk and uncertainty, and transformation is a necessity. This is why the African Union Development Agency, NEPAD, has worked to facilitate an African common position in advance of the Food Systems Summit, in line with the African Union's Agenda 2063 and the SDGs. Africa will pursue solutions in the following priority tracks. One, adopt nutritious food policies, establish food reserves, and expand school feeding programs. Two, support local markets and food supply ch chains, invest in agro-processing for healthy foods, and expand trade in food products within Africa. Three, work to increase agricultural financing to 10% of public expenditure with a focus on research, innovation, and environmental sustainability. Four, facilitate stakeholder farmers, encourage cooperatives, and ensure women's access to productive resources. And five, expand social safety net programs and invest in the climate early warning data systems. Accountability for advancing these actions will be integrated into existing continental monitoring mechanisms, including regional reviews under the comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. At the Food Systems Summit in September, we will begin to roll out new solutions based on this African common position and commit to greater investment in programs that are proven to work. For Africa, the central goal is to hold our continents over reliance on food imports and malnutrition and create millions of new jobs in the food economy. In doing so, we will strike the right balance between the people and the planet. The political commitment generated today is essential for solidifying the global partnerships needed to sustain the success of this historic process. If you, I wish you productive deliberations this week as we work together closely to deliver real results at the summit in September and beyond. I thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, President Kagame. And uh, thank you for reminding us that in a continent like Africa, where 75% of people uh, is involved in agriculture, those who take advantage of the food transformation systems are not there most of the time. So this is one of the key issues that we got to address here. But in the meantime, they told me that we have great news because the Secretary General moved back to his original identity. And so we are able to see him in person right now. So let's listen to the message of Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I am pleased to send greetings to this important meeting to prepare for the Food System Summit. We are at a pivotal moment. We are seriously off track to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Poverty, income inequality and high cost of food continue to keep healthy diets out of the reach of some 3 billion people. Climate change and conflict are both consequences and drivers of this catastrophe. Up to 811 million people faced hunger in 2020 
as many as 161 million more than in 2019, not least due to the disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic, which still assails us, has highlighted the links between inequality, poverty, food, disease and our planet. Our war against nature includes a food system that generates one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. And the same food system is responsible for up to 80% of biodiversity loss. Yet, there is hope. Since my initial call for this summit, you have responded with energy, ideas and a willingness to forge new partnerships. At this pre-summit, we can define the scope of our collective ambition and strengthen our efforts to achieve the 17 SDGs by transforming our food systems. I thank you for your work so far in making this both a people summit and a solution summit. Your leadership will help set a tone for the decade of action and an equitable and sustainable recovery from COVID-19. I look forward to welcoming you to New York in September, and I thank you. Thanks to the Secretary General. And, uh, you know, we listen to heads of state, inspiring figures, but there's no doubt that one of the most outspoken and influential figures that urged us to action has been Pope Francis. This is why I'm welcoming Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher, Secretary for Relations with States of the Vatican and Representative of His Holiness Pope Francis. Please, join us on stage. A message from His Holiness Pope Francis to the participants of the pre-summit for food systems of the UN. Mr. President, Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to extend a cordial greeting to all the participants in this important meeting, which once again highlights that one of our greatest current challenges is defeating hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition in the era of COVID-19. This pandemic has revealed to us the systemic injustice that undermines our unity as a human family. Our poorest brothers and sisters and the earth, our shared home, that cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods which, with which God has endowed her, all call for a radical change. We develop new technologies which allow us to increase the planet's capacity to bear fruit, and yet we continue exploiting nature to the point of rendering it barren thus increasing the extent not only of external deserts, but also of internal spiritual deserts. We produce enough food for everyone, but many go without their daily bread. This, this constitutes a genuine scandal, a crime that violates basic human rights. Therefore, it is the duty of all to eradicate this injustice through concrete actions and best practices and via bold local and international policies. In this view, a key role is played by the careful and correct transformation of food systems, which should aim to make them capable of increasing resilience strengthening local economies, improving nutrition, reducing food waste, providing healthy diets that are accessible to all, and being environmentally sustainable and respectful of local cultures. If we want to guarantee the fundamental right to an appropriate standard of living and fulfill our commitments to achieve the goal of zero hunger, it won't be enough to produce food. We need a new mentality and a new integrated approach. And we need to design food systems that will protect the earth and keep the dignity of the human being at their heart. 
that ensure sufficient food at a global level and promote decent work at the local level and that can feed the world of today without jeopardizing the future. It is essential to restore the centrality of the rural sector upon which so many basic human needs depend. And the agricultural sector urgently needs to recover its priority role in political and economic decision-making to lay the groundwork for the post-pandemic recovery process which is being built. In this process, smallholders and family farmers must be con considered priority players. Their traditional knowledge must not be overlooked or ignored, while their direct participation will allow them to better understand their priorities and real needs. It is important to facilitate smallholder and family farmers' access to necessary services for production, sale, and use of agricultural resources. The family is an essential component of food systems because it is in the family that we learn how to enjoy the fruits of the earth without abusing it and discover the most effective means for spreading lifestyles respectful of our personal and collective good. This recognition must go hand in hand with policies and initiatives that fully meet the needs of rural women, foster youth employment, and improve the working conditions of farmers in the poorest and most remote areas. We are aware that individual economic interests, closed and conflictive but powerful, prevent us from designing a food system that fulfills the values of the common good, solidarity, and the culture of encounter. If we want to maintain fruitful multilateralism and a food system based on responsibility, justice, peace, and the unity of the human family, then that is key. The crisis we are currently facing is, in reality, a unique opportunity to launch authentic, bold, and courageous dialogues addressing the root causes of our unjust food system. Throughout this summit, we have the responsibility of achieving the dream of a world in which bread, water, medicine, and work flow in abundance and reach the neediest first. The Holy See and the Catholic Church will be at the service of this noble objective, offering our contribution, joining forces, wills, actions, and wise decisions. I ask God that no one be left behind, that all people be able to meet their basic needs, that this encounter for the renewal of food systems put us on the path to building a peaceful and prosperous society and sow seeds of peace that will allow us to walk in true brotherhood. Francis. Pope Francis told us clearly what is needed is a new mentality, an integrated approach, because that's the only way to address systemic injustice in the world. Everybody here is committed to this exercise of leadership, but there is someone who decided this much before any of us. It was last November when uh, Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed decided to write to all the representatives of the government and told, that, told them, sorry about that, that they needed to engage 
to work, to act. It was time for speaking was over. It was a time for action. This is why I welcome her on stage. Please, floor is yours. Your Excellency Prime Minister Draghi, Excellency Prime Min President uh, Paul Kagame, His Holiness the Pope, ably represented by Cardinal Gallagher, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and colleagues. Under the able leadership of our host, Prime Minister Draghi, I would like to thank our Italian partners and our hosts for an incredible welcome here to Rome. I'd like to give additional appreciation for the guidance that we've had from Foreign Minister De Maio. Thank you. My appreciation to the leadership of FAO and to IFAD and to WFP, and especially the colleagues of the United Nations who have worked day and night over the last two years to make this happen. But my real appreciation goes to a woman of substance, and that is our special envoy, Agnes Kalibata. The United Nations is owned by member states, and we involve everyone. We stand for the world and for the charter that we represent. And so Agnes walked into the United Nations to help us to guide this process. We know how hard it is within the United Nations family to try to get to everyone with as much consensus as possible, and so we deeply appreciate your leadership over the last two years. We have just heard our leaders underscore the importance of this agenda and what the expectations are of this community. We heard Prime Minister Draghi underscore the word ambition. The last two years, the voices of the indigenous people, of civil society, of business, of our member states here in Rome, in New York, and more especially in our countries, each and every one of them has underscored the importance of action now. In these challenging times, it is this leadership that we need to push that ambition to achieve Agenda 2030. We still remain in the grips of the pandemic that has stolen lives and livelihoods and has contributed to a reversal of the Sustainable Development Goals progress. It has delayed action on many major transitions required to meet our 2030 goals, and this has contributed to the rise in hunger everywhere. Yet, just as I witnessed in a farmer's market supported by Coldretti here in Rome over the weekend, food has the power to bring us together around solutions and the challenges that we face. The leadership of member states and citizens in all regions is showing us that this agenda can be the tip of the arrow on the path to 2030. This leadership, built from the ground up, can underpin transformative action and change that is needed for our food systems to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. I am hopeful. We have hard work in front of us in the days and the months and the years to come to 2030. But we do have the ingredients to make this pre-summit the ambition that is needed for the leaders in New York to commit to. Let us keep the promise of the SDGs for our people and for the planet. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary General. Thank you for your strength and your work. Let me thank again Secretary General, all the states of government, all the delegates. There's a lot of work we've got to do ahead. We will be back in a few seconds to discuss all the issues, even with the shareholders and the stakeholders who are, who are able to transform our messages into action. We will be back in a few seconds. Thank you.
David. Adam. Adam, I'm sorry. Uh, I started calling you David from yesterday, so that's fine. Um, Abdul Razak is the one who's uh, online. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. I had a moment in which I said, okay, we we'll get a problem. <laughs> uh,
Good afternoon. Back again in the plenary hall. Good afternoon again to everybody. Uh, in the problem today <laughs> okay can you listen to me right now perfect so we're back in the plenary room and uh, we have now to discuss uh, uh, the issues and to in some ways uh, point out solutions we should be brave enough to imagine how the world can change but before introducing our panelists that will discuss uh, the acceleration of the critical transition required, let me do something different. Because, you know, we spoke of this long journey. We spoke about this process, which is not something taking place today. And we said that many of you, many of you that through your laptop and computers and screens are connected with us and ideally here in this room with us, trying to change the world and reality, but someone is here. So let me recognize the national conveners coming here. And so I will ask them to stand up and be recognizable, just to be able to say to them, thank you for everything they did in this long year. So uh, here are the conveners, one of the conveners, please stand up and let us applaud you and what you have done without you. Without you, without your energy, without your leadership, this would be one of those many summits in, in which you just talk and then go back home and everything is exactly the same. Is what you have done this year, you and all those people there that we see in the mega screens that are trying to change reality. But let me introduce our panelists that uh, will help us understand how we can accelerate this transition, how we can make it happen soon. First of all, Julie. Good afternoon. Julie Shilombo. She's Assistant Coordinator for the Management of External Resources and Project Monitoring and Evaluation of the Presidency of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Welcome on stage. We have uh, in uh, virtual connection with us, uh, Muhammad Abdul Razak, who is Minister of Agriculture of Bangladesh. Uh, I hope he can hear us. Here we go. Minister, welcome to our plenary room. Close to me, we have Mrs. Leah Tadesse, who is Minister of Health in Ethiopia. Minister, welcome this afternoon here. And. Uh, Mauricio Guevara Pinto, the Secretary of State in the Office of Agriculture and Livestock in Honduras, coming from another part of the world as well, which is fascinating. We're really feeling the world all together in the same room this afternoon. And uh, Janusz Voce, I was sure, sir, I must ask you to help me with your family name, because all the time it happens to me. So, Wojciechowski, who's the Commissioner for Agriculture of European Commission, an important voice here this afternoon. Then we have many other voices that will uh, jump on stage and contribute to our discussion and to really shape the future action. But first of all, let me just uh, start uh, uh, with this uh, reflection because, uh, Julie, uh, you know, we uh, heard the Pope message about uh, uh, injustice, hunger, how to address these issues. And I think these issues are uh, one of those, you know, quite well. So would you mind to share with us your thoughts and your direction to action? Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, bonjour. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Silombo from DRC. I work at the president's office um, and I follow projects. I monitor projects. I was a focal point for the um, organization of um, focal points around this summit. Um, the uh, 
Congo, in the Republic of Congo, embarked on this adventure, if I may call it so, in April. We were waiting for the government to actually take official ownership of the process. The problem of hunger, of course, uh, con uh, does concern the DRC, which is a very large country with a great potential, as everybody knows. But in spite of all that potential, we have about 20 million people who are um, on the brink of starvation. And so this is a problem that's um, something very close to the, our heart. So with the support of the Ministry of Agriculture, we're able to put together a task force so, which brought together different ministries involved uh, in the food systems. And uh, we have, for example, the Ministry of Rural Development, uh, that for scientific research, uh, uh, animal raising and fisheries, industry, foreign trade. So several ministries were represented in this task force, and uh, we organized a number of uh, processes. And so uh, we gathered together civil society, the private sector, uh, small producers, uh, smallholder farmers, but also technical partners like uh, FAO, EFAD, and WFP. And, uh, over about a month, we held several meetings involving about 50 to 70 people. We had several discussions and negotiations concerning uh, the various chains in or links in the food chain. We talked about several issues like access to market, land tenure, and um, the consumption of food. And as you probably know, DRC has an energy challenge right now. So we really did talk about uh, the uh, problem of uh, distributing foodstuffs and commodities around uh, um, the physical facilities established in the country. We have great challenges when it comes to infrastructure, of course, and transportation. We also talked about consumption, nutrition, and uh, uh, the disposal of uh, the different waste uh, that is produced uh, along the value chain. Now, of course, uh, we focused on governance, uh, and uh, we readily understood that although people might be in good faith, and as President Kagame said, um, in DRC, also, 70% of our population is involved in agriculture. That's what their livelihoods are based on. But in spite of that, the challenge is at the level of infrastructure, and that falls within the realm of public authority. So here, governance really plays a huge role in the challenge of sustainability and of food systems in DRC. So all of these negotiations and efforts made it possible to establish a dialogue platform amongst the various stakeholders, um, and including the public authorities and especially our partners. Each partner had the opportunity to expose the different projects and programs and the, the different support measures that they're offering DRC and directly also to the beneficiaries like producers. And in turn, uh, the beneficiaries were able to establish this direct dialogue with partners. We greatly appreciated this exercise. Uh, this great exchange uh, and the resolution that uh, we adopted, amongst many other, is to be able to make uh, uh, this kind of exercise around food systems sustainable and to replicate it. Now, we have a special program to combat inequalities, uh, and that was uh, embraced by our um, president. It's one of his priorities, and the task force that we established is going to be able to integrate this program within their endeavors so that we can have a roadmap which is really um, feasible. So we really would like to take this opportunity to thank the UN and all the organizers that enabled the DRC to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you for having shared that beautiful story with us. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thanks for uh, telling us your story because uh, one of the uh, most important things here is the possibility to exchange experiences and to learn lessons one from the other. And this is a great lesson that can be shared and can 
maybe improve and uh, convince someone else to take action on this. But exactly for this, let me go to Bangladesh because the Minister of Agriculture can share with us his experience and can share with us their vision and what they are doing to address this kind of, pro of problems, especially looking at hunger, poverty and uh, their relation to environment, because that's another chapter of the story, how these two things can be addressed together in a sustainable way. Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable, honorable Chair of the session, Excellencies, distinguished panel members, delegates, and participants, ladies and gentlemen, warm greetings to you all. It is my great pleasure to be able to speak before such distinguished delegates from around the world at this important session, building on the leadership and commitments of the high-level segment convened a while ago. On behalf of the government of Bangladesh and its people, I would like to convey thanks and gratitude to the United Nations, the Italian government, and the FAO for organizing the pre-summit to EONO Food Systems Summit at this critical juncture of COVID-19 pandemic. Let me contextualize the future we want, which respect to transforming food system in the globe in general and Bangladesh in particular. This would definitely remind us of the goals and targets of SDG 2 on zero hunger. It targets and subsequent policies and strategies and action of a country in question to achieve those. The outcome level targets related to nutrition security are prevalence of undernourished based on a calorie threshold set by FAO, prevalence of under five children stunting and wasting, and the perception-based food insecurity in experience scale. There are ostensibly related to agricultural production and productivity when it comes to supply and availability of and access to diverse food. More specifically, doubling the productivity per unit labor, doubling income of the bottom 40% of the farm households, ensuring safe food and sustainable agriculture in economic, environmental, and socioeconomic terms strengthening research, etc., are some of the critical issues that calls for deeper discussion. In view of Bangladesh, agriculture has always been an important engine of overall economic growth of the country because a majority of our population is dependent on agriculture and allied activities. And the sector has driven rural development and poverty reduction in our country. Agriculture growth increased from 2% per annum in the 1980s to 3.5% in the 2010s. The sector contributes about 13% of GDP and provides about 40% of employment. Over time, the yield of major agricultural product has increased substantially from only 1.7 ton per hectare in 1991. The Paddy yield increased per annum to over 4 million ton, over 4 million ton in 2020. The yields of major crops have also significantly increased. Food grain production increased from only 10 million metric ton in 1971 to a over 41 million metric ton in 2020, that's now. Bangladesh is self-sufficient in rice, the staple food of the people. Climate resilient crop varieties are also being developed. Now the question is whether the present trend would suffice to achieve the SDG target that I have mentioned. If not, what would be investment level in business as usual scenario? Where from the money would come? Government, private sector, or and development partners? At what proportion? The critical transformation in food system that will be required to achieve the 2030 agenda would therefore call for shift subsistence to commercialize modern, resilient, safe, efficient food value chain with windows for reduced post-harvest, 
food and nutrition losses and definitely embarked on a nutrition sensitive and diverse agriculture. Look, this have to happen amid significant risks and challenges including effects of climate change that are demonstrated through land degradation, sanity, salinity, salinity intrusion, extreme temperature, both water shortage in dry season and abundance during rainy season, and continued natural disaster with higher intensity would necessitate further research and innovation. Population growth and urbanization are both continuing at pace and they are changing food supply chain, private sector involvement, household food consumption patterns, and land use and environmental hazards. Ensuring food safety across the food chain, even though progress has been made to create a necessary legislation, enabling policies, regulatory environment, and institution under the purview of Safe Food Act of 2013. GAP, good agriculture practice, and one health policies and protocols. COVID-19 impacts that necessitated strengthening programs and projects for Build Back Better, like provision of input support, including expanding mechanization in each stage to change farmers' adaptive capacities and sustain crop productivity in Bangladesh. Crop diversification that would require free of lands from rice possible through multiplying rice yields and increase crop intensity to the extent it is the detrimental to the soil health. Migrating agriculture level to be addressed through technologies that would significantly mechanize the process and bring down the need for labor while ensuring the sustenance of the food production. Investment of agro-processing and mechanization to minimize losses, create employment, and to invigorate rural non-farm sector in support of agriculture. So the pathways are not straightforward as we have to see. Interest of marginal and small farmers and also women folk having constraints of economy of scale, poor and low income consumer having limited purchasing power, etc including the political economy of it. In most cases, the policymakers need to look through the trade-offs between and across options. Nonetheless, our future food system needs to focus on balanced nutrition, safe food, etc., through adoption of GAP and further increase in agriculture diversification while maintaining food security through improvements in farm productivity, supply of inputs, price support, water supply, farm credit, and marketing support. Agriculture exports need to be promoted to increase farm income and employment. Facilitating research and innovation, attracting youth in agro-processing, mechanization and value addition venture, along with the adoption of precision agriculture, would require a huge investment flows partnership and coalition within domestic stakeholders and within developing countries would add to the efforts of national government in this regard. Sure. I stop here and look forward to hearing from the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. Thanks for addressing all these different uh, aspects uh, that are involved here. But as I was telling you at the beginning, we are going to have some reflection from, uh, from the room. And we have here the privilege of having uh, with us uh, Gerd Müller, who is the Minister of Development of Germany. And uh, uh, I think, yeah, you can take your mic out there because uh, Gert Müller has uh, a particular focus on uh, struggling to get to zero hunger. So this is why I will ask him to drop into the conversation right now. I think you can speak from your mic yeah, out thank there. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we, we know the causes for hunger. Uh, we talked about this. We have heard uh, um, Beasley, Mr. Beasley. And now, what's about the solutions? The solutions 
Let me tell you five priorities for action. Five priorities. First, a world without hunger must be the top priority on the international agenda. We need the political will in politics, business, and society. It must be the top priority. Second, we need to double because of the current situation. David Beasley spoke about this. That must be a signal from this meeting. We need to double the current volume of emergency relief and close the financing gap of the WFP. That is a scandal. Eight billion financial gap. And we need an additional 40 billion per year by 2013 to eradicate hunger. Third, we must beat COVID-19 together. That's very important even for food crisis, for hunger. And therefore, we need global access to vaccines for all. It is a scandal. 3% of the Africans in developing countries do have access to vaccine. That is inacceptable, unacceptable. Fourth, globalization must become more just. What does it mean? We must stop exploiting people and nature. We need fair supply change. And especially the uh, industrial countries must commit themselves much more strongly. And fifth, we need a green sustainable transformation in agriculture, industry, energy production, with empowerment of women, with digitalization, and a skills and education revolution. The excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and then I'm convinced the world without hunger is possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being uh, uh, positive and uh, uh, provocative. And uh, uh, let me just go to uh, Mrs. Lea today's uh, minister. You know, Minister of Bangladesh was uh, addressing the, the many issues that are connected to, to food. But uh, uh, during the dialogues in your country, there was this link between food and uh, agriculture and health that came up as a real issue. So we would like you to, to drag this uh, topic on our floor here. Thank you very much, uh, Session Chair. It's really a pleasure to be here in this uh, joint forces that are trying to address this huge global issue, which is really an urgent issue for all of us. Uh, indeed, undernutrition with poor diet, uh, very low diet diversity, and uh, low access to uh, nutrient-dense foods is one of our biggest challenges as a country in Ethiopia. Of course, we've had a uh, lot of progress in terms of reducing stunting in the past 15 to 20 years, from as high as 58% of children under five being stunted to the current around 37%. But you can see how high it is still in terms of both the health, uh, the malnutrition side, the economy, the human capital development, and many aspects of uh, undernutrition. So it has been one of uh, high priority agenda for the government for the, the past years and uh, there are food and nutrition policy and um, interrelated uh, implementing strategies as well as a unique program that we have we call Sakota Declaration that was launched around four uh, years ago uh, with a high level government commitment to end stunting uh, was there which was a joint effort by different government sectors. But when this uh, process of the food system transformation plan uh, was initiated, this came as a huge opportunity for us uh, in terms of accelerating those efforts uh, and bringing really new insights, but also uh, bringing key stakeholders who are not at the table in our previous initiatives. So when this process of uh, the Ethiopian food uh, system transformation uh, uh, process started, uh, we, of course, established the conveners, which is the Minister of Agriculture, who's also in the room, and, and myself as the Minister of Health as co-conveners, but we engaged the different sectors, the intersect, intersectors, because there are several sectors who have been working in trying to address nutrition and undernutrition in the country, so both at national and subnational level, but also 
different stakeholders, uh, uh, civil society, academia, universities, international NGOs, the UN uh, partners, and very, most, uh, very importantly, the private sector, including SMEs and small farm holders and uh, key private sector uh, uh, stakeholders. And I'm, I'm emphasizing this because many of our uh, previous initiatives that was not strong. So this was really key in the transformation we want to bring both in the whole cycle of the food system from production, uh, preparation, dissemination, up to consumption of uh, diverse foods. Uh, the, the, the private sector and the civil society has really a strong role. So with this, we started the process. We've had um, round tables and three series, a series of national dialogues, each with different objectives, starting from identifying what is the current state of food system in Ethiopia, and then defining what are the game changer interventions that are needed now to move forward, to bring the transformation we need. So of course, with all the st those stakeholders together, we initially came up with um, around 83 interventions. So prioritization and refining this was another process. Uh, and uh, we finally came out, came down to 22 uh, refined game-changing interventions, which we recently launched uh, with a position paper as a country. So uh, it had, the process was really insightful in terms of uh, showing those interrelationships, integration of what each actor can do, because initially the challenge, one of the challenges we faced, of course, was um, each sector would like to focus their own areas, but the, bringing uh, us all together and looking at the food system as a framework, not in silos, but as a framework, so that we can really bring the change that we want. So. Uh, with that process now, we are now moving towards redefining the roadmap and the activities for the key interventions and, of course, the resources, which is really the key issue here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for reminding us that there is this intersection uh, between different uh, aspects and inside society, which takes us back to the beginning of our conversation when we were stating this idea that food is like a connective tissue. We can see this connectivity through society and through people in different domains. This is why I would like to, uh, according to the conversation, the Secretary of State uh, for Agriculture and Livestock of Honduras, because here the connection between food, nutrition, health is uh, at the center of the stage. Sí, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the government of Italy and I'd like to thank all the members and the FAO team for the extraordinary work that they have done to ensure that all the members of the delegations who wanted to be present physically in the FAO were able to do so. This meeting has been organized with great success. Certainly, the issue of food security is linked with many aspects, particularly in our region, in Central America, where we are members of the CAC, which is the Council of Ministers of Central America. This includes Dominican Republic and Mexico. And in that forum, we have addressed issues that are recurrent in the different countries. The difference is that my country, Honduras, is one of the two most vulnerable is one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. This is a topic that we have been addressing over the past 15 years. It's uh, something we've addressed through different initiatives because if we don't change, nothing changes. We need to be creative and apply technology in order to increase our productivity with our traditional producers and to make sure the population has access to food. The year of COVID is one in which I think no country was prepared. No country was prepared for COVID-19. And at that very, in that very same year, we experienced two hurricanes 15 days apart. And this further increased the severity of food insecurity. And of course, it impacted the economy of our country. 
Our producers did not have purchasing power because the cities were being shut down. And so, of course, there were problems in terms of production and income. The same applies to exports and family farming. Our government has been working all along the chain to provide, for example, financing at low interest rates. We're working to be inclusive, not only in terms of private banks, but also creating financing programs for producers who cannot access private banking financing. We're also making technical assistance a main priority. We are working to make sure that productivity and productive technology is being provided along with technical support for these smallholders. And we consider them to be real heroes, and they have helped us through the pandemic and the hurricanes we experienced. And thank God we did have the political support of the President of the Republic, and we had programs to carry out that transformation from traditional agriculture to more technical agriculture with protected areas, uh, biological protection, pest control, reducing the use of pesticides, and of course, regaining access to markets. Bringing the food from the field to the table of each, of each citizen has been one of our main priorities in the government of President Hernandez. And of course, with this initiative of the Secretary General of the United Nations and with the holding of the summit, the Food Systems Summit, we have had different meetings with various stakeholders, youth, civil society, indigenous leaders, women, the private sector, academia, which is very important. And we've also seen the problem of generational turnover, where youth, young people no longer want to participate in agriculture. Their parents have helped their children go to university and then we see this concern about the potential abandonment of farms. We are trying to incentivize domestic production. We have another problem, which is the free trade agreements, which means that we are competing, despite uh, tariffs, with countries, developed countries that subsidize agriculture, and we, as a developing country can't be competitive in that arena. So we have had to be creative, seeking alternatives, not only growing traditional crops, so yes for subsistence and yes for crop rotation, but trying to also address the issue of uh, pesticides and plant diseases. But as I say, at the same time, seeking to uh, grow more international crops, including avocado and coffee. That's particularly important with thousands of farmers in both of these sectors. And we're doing this to try to open up the markets to these smallholders with organization with, through cooperatives and associations so that these smallholders can be empowered through financing, increasing their pr productivity, accessing internal markets, and of course, seeking the external market as well. When it comes to nutrition and the nutrition of our young people, that's another important component, health and nutrition, so that the result of the production of these smallholders can be introduced into people's diets, so protein, eggs, fish like tilapia, which is a very cheap source of protein for our people so that those children can continue to grow and develop properly as they should. We have invested in farms. President Hernandez has listed agriculture as priority one in our country's policies, and we will continue working hand-in-hand -hand with our producers, supporting them in all of these areas, financing, access to markets, 
technical support, etc., so that we can overcome this avalanche of problems that we have encountered. There's climate change, which is very serious. There's the issue of tariffs and the issue of productivity and new markets. I think that we have done a great deal. We have changed a great deal in the dry corridor and in terms of traditional agriculture, adding technology to that. Now we have roughly 25 million pounds of fruits and vegetables to cover half the country's demand. Producers who were previously in extreme poverty are being supported, and all of these programs and projects are being managed with the idea that families need to have income that is sustainable throughout the year and growing crops that will be useful to the producers. Uh, thank you, Minister, because I do think that uh, you mentioned uh, several times this idea of finance, of make it sustainable uh, on the long run. So let me just go to another reflection from uh, uh, the floor, actually is virtual, from uh, Martin Van Nieuwkop, because uh, uh, he's from the World Bank and uh, he can help us uh, in this uh, uh, framing of how it can be financially sustainable, this kind of process. Let's see if it comes up on some screen. Martin? No. There's a problem in the connection. Uh, yes, okay. Pero le puedo apoyar con ese tema. <laughs> yes, but the pro I can continue in that topic. He isn't a friend. He is a friend. And it's a very important topic in terms of financing and private banks. Um, it's quite difficult to start addressing uh, something that is not going okay. to be able to answer. So, no, let's wait for a second. If, if any connection comes up, we're going to discuss that later on. But, uh, okay, here is, because I couldn't see that now. Uh, Martin, can you hear us? Okay, so. So, so can you hear me? Because I. Yeah, I couldn't, now, I couldn't, now that's I fine. Now that's I, fine. I, I, I couldn't Connection mute myself, so I hope I. Okay, very good. Well, thanks very much, Monica, and uh, greetings to all. And it's a very pleasure to be on this important panel today. And of course, a very important question that you, that you posed on the financing, uh, the food systems uh, transition. Um, so, so let me start uh, by saying that part of the work on the finance lever for the UN Food System Summit, I mean, the World Bank and the International Food Policy Research Institute and the Food and Land Use Coalition have been actively engaging with relevant stakeholders over the last eight months or so, I mean, to, re to rethink, I mean, the financial incentives, I mean, that govern our food systems. Uh, and the focus on finance, I mean, came from looking at food systems in a more holistic fashion and realizing that the costs and benefits, I mean, of the food system are totally out of sync. I mean, by some accounts, I mean, the hidden cost of the current food and land use systems, so it measured in things like malnutrition and obesity, welfare losses, I mean, deforestation, pollution, now amount to about $12 trillion per year. And this is actually, this is more, I mean, than the market value of the food systems that is estimated at $10 trillion per year. So the food system is generating um, huge hidden costs. I mean, what's particularly frustrating, we think, is that these costly negative outcomes can be avoided. I mean, the food system is off track. I mean, despite deliberate policy choices, uh, robust public and private investments, and sizable consumer spending. And the question then is, as you, as you said, Monica, how can you put in place clear incentives, I mean, towards healthier outcomes for people the planet and the economy, and how do we use financing as a lever, I mean, to reduce negative costs and enhance the benefits associated with farming and food? Now, of course, the solutions are many, and we've heard already quite a few, but for the sake of brevity, I mean, we think in the finance lever that they fall into three big buckets. I mean, realigning, first, realigning public policies and public support. I mean, second bucket is greening private sector investments. 
And third bucket is increasing consumer access, I mean, to healthy food. Now, when it comes to public policies and public support, I mean, the data that we have from 79, 79 counties from the consortium on agriculture incentives, and we show that governments support agriculture producers to the tune of $506 billion per year. Of course, many governments are present in the audience today. Only 5% of that spending goes towards green subsidies, while 65% of that spending has negative impacts. Uh, so there's a growing consensus that governments and their partners must, must instead prioritize programs that support a healthy planet, a healthy uh, people, and a healthy economy. And these priorities include the following, we think. I mean, first, reducing food loss and waste. I mean, to get more food out of the same agricultural land and value chains without increasing emissions. Investing in research and development to increase productivity while lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And also to enhance the resilience of agricultural production systems and supply chains to help farmers and food processors withstand climate extremes across a variety of landscapes. Um, another element would be to reform policies and public support that create incentives to overproduce cereals and not enough incentives to grow fresh food. And this would help increase the affordability of healthy diets. And of course, invest in training to diversify jobs and grow incomes in rural areas so that farmer workers don't see their incomes plummet over time. If managed well, public policy reform should have the buy-in, we think, of millions of farmers who will benefit from new markets, increased productivity, and better protection against the, uh, the impacts of, uh, of climate sure. change. Now, of course, also, besides the public sector, Monica, the private sector has a very important role to play, since most actors in the food systems are private businesses that respond to market incentives and oper operate within set rules and regulations. Uh, we think, I mean, that the world needs concrete measures I mean, to level the playing field for, for socially, environmentally, and nutritionally responsible food production and marketing. And for that reason, those measures, we think, include, for example, moving from voluntary to mandatory ESG disclosures, environment and social and government disclosures by the private sector, investing in better tracking of commodities and food products for greater transparency, and developing financial instruments that can de-risk investments in sustainable supply chains. And of course, the third bucket, buckets, I mean, consumer spending is a lever that should not be overlooked. Uh, consumer spending on food accounts for about 12 to 15 percent of global GDP, global GDP, $87 trillion per year. But yet that level of spending is deceiving. I mean, for the poorest households who spend a disproportionate uh, share of their income on food, that spending is not enough, I mean, to afford fresh and healthy food. The high cost of nutritious food put healthy diets out of financial reach for 3 billion people, I mean, worldwide. In addition to removing current price distortions, we need to strengthen then social safety programs and perhaps rethink poverty lines. I mean, the absolute poverty line of $1.90 a day so that families are able to cover their nutrition needs and not, and not just uh, uh, calories. Uh, from where I'm sitting, I mean, the World Bank, and the World Bank is extremely committed I mean, to working with counties and partners to move financial solutions forward to support healthy people, a healthy planet, yeah. and a healthy uh, economy. And let me finish, Monica, by mentioning that tomorrow, I mean, the Finance Lever team is organizing a session on better finance, better food, how to scale finance for sustainable food systems. And for those interested, I mean, this session will provide a further deep dive on financing food systems transformation. Thank you, and back to you, Monica. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, because uh, really you could point out and help us pointing out how important is also the systemic approach to this. And this is why I'm uh, staring at uh, Commissioner Wojciechowski for Agriculture, because uh, what Europe is doing in this moment could be key. And uh, the uh, Green New Deal in some ways could be a great tool for change, but is that, is that happening? So give us good news. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, uh, that, uh, thank you, for, uh, first of all, for the invitation for this very interesting, very important debate and very t timely debate. Uh, we know what is the, the, the situation that uh, we have the COVID crisis, we have a hunger crisis, the population uh, undernourished, 
We have a crisis of nature, the global uh, the, the droughts, flo floods, wildfires, and uh, this is the, the, the problem. I can add the, also the social problem in our agriculture, the problem especially of the small, small family farms. I, I'd like to, 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 inf to, not to inform, to remind that during one decade, from 2005 to 2015, in the European U Union, we lost 4 million small family farms, which is uh, uh, the process in uh, 1,000 farms per day. We lost such number of, of small farms, which, is very, uh, which has a very negative impact for condition of the, our, our food system. Uh, we can observe that such uh, the, 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 the phenomena, this is, I think, the, the, on the global level, the, the, it, it was, uh, we could hear very important words of the Pope Francis. I'd like to, rem to, to remember also the important words of the Pope uh, John Paul II. Sometimes we discuss about the, our challenges in, in, in um, uh, food system as a political issue, left, uh, right, uh, liberals, conservatives, but this is the... The, 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 uh, uh, it's worthy to know that the, to remain the words. The, the Pope say, said to the to the farmers. It was words the, dedicated to the farmers. Uh, we need to resist the temptation to increase productivity and profit to the detriment of nature. When man forgets this principle, nature will rebel against him. And we can observe the, the symptoms of this, this rebel, as I said before, the drought, floods, the wildfires, etc. Et and what should be the answer, to what is the European Union answer? As you said, of course, the Green Deal with its biodiversity and first of all with farm to fork strategy. Uh, I'd like to remind the, the words of the President von der Leyen, the, 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 uh, her, uh, sorry, because <laughs> I need to use better the, the, the microphone. Uh, President von der Leyen uh, said that uh, European Green Deal allows us to design and choose better and healthier and a more prosperous way for, for the future. Farm to fork strategies is very important because, uh, first of all, we need to reduce the distance from farm to fork. And, uh, uh, I'd like also to remain that the statistic, according to the statistic data of Eurostat, we transport across the Europe about the three, million, three billion tons of the agri and food products. On the distance, uh, uh, the scale of the transport is 540 billion tons a kilometer, which, which means that we transport each statistical piece of food uh, the statistic distance is 180 kilometer. Uh, of course, we need to transport our food. Uh, that's, uh, we need the in trade, international trade, of course. But we need uh, to uh, uh, strengthen our food system uh, uh, and uh, use the all possible instrument for uh, to, sh to, short, uh, to, to create short supply chain to deliver our food, to supply the food to the local market, to use the possibility of, of this. And this is one of the targets of the farm to, farm to fork strategy. Very, very important target. Of course, we need to reduce use of pesticides, use of fertilizers to increase uh, the organic farming, which is the very important, very ambitious targets to increase uh, um, uh, area under organic farming from current level, which is 8% in sure. the European Union, to the 25%. This is the chance, that, uh, this is the chance also to, inc to uh, uh, increase the food security, because we can observe many farms in the European Union for, uh, for which the, the, uh, this is only one uh, option, to be organic or to be not able in the competition, in the massive, intensive production. We need to remember that, uh, that agriculture is not industry. The agriculture land is not factory. Animals are not machines. This is the reason that we need to 
make our agriculture policy, uh, our agriculture more friendly for the environment, for the climate, for the environment, for the animal welfare, and also the, our agriculture policy more friendly for our farmers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you reminded us uh, of this uh, connection uh, on the planet with uh, animals and things that are not machines. Let me go to the uh, CEO of uh, uh, Imagine, uh, Paul Polman, because he wanted to share with us a couple of reflections. And so let's go and explore a little more this connection with nature. Yeah, sorry, before I started, I wanted to thank as well the uh, Secretary General and Amina, the Deputy Secretary General, and Rome, obviously, for hosting it. But above all, with all the work we've done, I want to thank Agnes for her tireless uh, efforts here. Uh, to be frank, if you come from outer space, you must think we are nuts in the way we handle our food systems and um, put in doing so our own uh, existence actually at risk. Our food system is clearly failing us miserably. You've heard many examples in the panel, and it requires very, very strong systems change. And frankly, ambition is the only word, but probably it's not even enough. We know what needs to be done, and, and frankly, we have examples enough. The technology is available. Um, with our own existence being put at risk, with enormously attractive economics, it's just mind-boggling to me that we're not moving faster. We've heard over and over that our current food systems prioritize volume above nutritional values, um, refuses to pay living wages to most of them in the value chain, um, treats nature or the environment as if it is an infinite resource. And as a result, we're seeing the rapid degradation of, frankly, people and planet here. Uh, over 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions hardly being mentioned in climate negotiations. 70% of freshwater use, 80% of land conversion, the single biggest driver to biodiversity loss. You'd think it would be high on the agenda just coming out of COVID, a clear result, which has cost us, by the way, already over $20 trillion in the global economy. And then, obviously, the poor human health. It is good to point out, perhaps, that even before COVID, it wasn't working. It's not something that we're discovering now. It is impossible to achieve the Paris agreements on climate or the sustainable development goals if we don't drastically change the food system. And the most interesting thing is that of all the options we've looked at in any part of the sustainable development goals, this probably has the highest return from an ecological, from a social, as well as from a financial perspective. Anybody that looks into this can see the enormous opportunities, and that's also true for the private sector. You've heard from Martin that the food system, I think he mentioned the number of 12 trillion in hidden cost. The price of food that we pay in reality is two to three times higher for society than the price we're actually paying. We also see that we can turn this around with a relatively small investment, believe it or not, of three to four hundred billion dollars, an amount that we're not having sleepless nights about anymore in today's wealth, we can turn it into a four to five trillion dollar positive economic force and frankly sure. save trillions of dollars in damages to people and, and planet. So what is missing here? I think the only thing is missing, frankly, is human willpower. It requires courage to move at speed. And my, my simple question is, do we really care? Because none of these issues that are being rehashed on the panel over and over, I knew they were on the panel last year, the year before, two or five years ago and 10 years ago. It requires us, frankly, to look at the whole system uh, of, of food and, and look at food systems productivity versus the narrow look of agricultural productivity. It requires us to integrate biodiversity into agriculture. You know, with the three to four hundred billion investment, just to be very simple and to be very quick, we can actually double our agricultural productivity and half the resource input. We can repurpose the five to seven hundred million per subsidies sure. that are still in the system. We can strengthen resilience and lower the risk, especially once more for the more vulnerable people. And we can obviously 
ensure that we have the financial flow going in, the, the three to four bill, trillion dollars a year that is needed. I hope that the food summit that we will have in September has at least the courage now for once to come up with bold targets. Bold targets on health and nutrition. How do we lay, eliminate hunger for the 800 million people in this world? Or half the number of people that uh, suffer from unhealthy diets? How can we work on economic recovery and prosperity? Create at least 100 million decent jobs in the value chain? And how can we reverse climate change and obviously work on the regenerative part of agriculture? We have well overshoot our planetary boundaries. Circular Absolutely. economy packages are not enough. We need to think regenerative in restoring nature, in moving to regenerative agriculture and carbon capture, in shifting to a more plant-based diet, as you have heard. Absolutely. For it's that, a... we need to have the courage at least to have all the countries submit in my opinion, the country food system pathways, just like we're doing on climate, what are we doing on food by country? And then review it together at least every two or three years, not only to look at the progress we've made, but hopefully set new targets, increase ambitions, accelerate actions, and most importantly, for once at least, as we talk about humanity, hold ourselves accountable for the commitments. What Absolutely. Agnes has done, in my opinion, is create a movement, a movement of food entrepreneurs, of activists, of citizens. They are ready to take actions, ready to take actions to get the high performing and equitable food system once and for all. This is a once in a generation opportunity. And I think the race is on. No the doubt race is on it's for a one in a generation nature positive, net zero, resilient food systems that once and for all are allowing us to stay healthy, be obviously abundant and feed the world, and most importantly, be equitable. If we miss this opportunity, we miss mankind. Thank I you, thank you very much. Challenge. And really sorry to interrupt, but really time is running fast and uh, we got a few voices to collect. It's really, really late. So you were addressing courage and uh, there's someone who has a lot of courage and uh, it's uh, Yugratna Siristava because uh, she uh, she's connecting with us from uh, uh, the center uh, of India and uh, um, he's... Uh, uh, one of those people of the youth constituency, which is a key part of our discussion here, because uh, everything we said is connected to creating a future for a uh, younger generation. So, your reflections, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I, I hope you can see me. I'm, I'm right here, actually, <laughs> not, yeah. not in India. Uh, so, they told uh, me you were virtual instead. You're here, and uh, we're so happy to have you <laughs> with <you>. us. <laughs> Dear Deputy Secretary General, Special Envoy on Food Systems, Member States, Youth Delegates, and Stakeholders, I'm Yugratna from India, part of the UNFSS Champions Group, an elected focal point of the Children and Youth Constituency to UN Environment Program, and it's an honor to speak here. Around 10 youth delegates are participating in person here, and hundreds of our colleagues are joining virtually. The summit has a unique model of youth co-leadership, where youth are leading action tracks as vice chairs, engaged in the Champions Network, and various self-organized working groups. We hope that the future high-level UN meetings, and there will be many, build upon such models. For children and youth of the world, food systems transformation is a matter of justice between generations and people. Those that are already vulnerable, young people from island states, indigenous youth, feel the worst impact of the crisis and have least access to decision making. This is about us and it cannot be without us. We demand meaningful youth engagement, not just in words, but in your actions. One can talk about specific examples, how food projects by Green Climate Fund lack direct focus on youth, how almost every second death among children under age of five is due to malnutrition. However, the underlying matter is the same. The policies that you make will directly impact livelihood of young and future generations. Therefore, young people should be viewed not just as stakeholders, but as rights holders in shaping the policy discourse. We call for intergenerational co-leadership. When you develop NDCs, biodiversity, or pollution plans, please have youth co-design them. Make all conversations intergenerational. Make all spaces intergenerational. Nothing about us without us. Our actions for youth need to be rooted in reality. 
We need to meet children and youth where they are at. Most youth-led organizations on food systems operate voluntarily or with very little budget. They do not have office buildings or staff to prepare annual reports or accredit them to the UN. Yet, these grassroots youth groups change things and generate ripples. Bringing a few youth to the UN is not enough. It is important that member states and UN agencies reach out and work with young people in a structured way. And let us remember, while we absolutely need everyone at the table, power structures that are exacerbating the existential crisis of today have to be held accountable. The polluters have to pay. We also want to recognize the progress that is happening. The CFS-CSM process has an official youth constituency. FAO recently started the World Food Forum, and earlier this month, the official youth task force of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration was operationalized, a structure that puts youth in governance on ecosystem. While these are good examples, UN agencies and member states need to do way more to create institutionalized, mandated, and designated spaces for children and youth in food policy. When youth are tokenized, it is not just the youth that suffer, it is the system tokenizing them that suffer as well. Therefore, we remind you again, nothing about us without us. Finally, while the UN commemorated its 75th anniversary last year, and UNEP will celebrate its 50th birthday next year, let us remember we do not have next 50 or 75 years to solve these crises. The action and political leadership is needed now and needed urgently. In coming months, youth organizations will be hosting a number of processes in lead up to COPS, Food Forum, UNIA 5, and culminating into Stockholm Plus 50 Youth Assembly next year, working and advocating hours and hours voluntarily. We invite you, Madam DSG, member states and colleagues, to join us and work with youth. And do not forget, today at 5.30 p.m., to join us in Green Room, where youth will be presenting a lot of their substantive priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your inter intervention. Thank you for your energy and leadership. And the message here is clear. Make all the conversations intergenerational, because that's the key point. Not decide our future uh, without talking to us. Um, Let's, this time uh, it's virtual, I'm sure. We're going to uh, Mira Kanyan Kane. Uh, she is the chairperson of the Center for Autonomy and Development of Indigenous People. She has a message to convey to this room, and I give her the floor for her message here. Thank you very much. I bring you greetings from the village of a village in Nicaragua. Moderators, ladies and gentlemen, our indigenous food systems are the foundation of our identities, and uh, they lie at the base of our livelihoods. And this is why we've been able to survive as indigenous peoples. Our resilience is intrinsic to our uh, ecosystem and biodiversity. Our food systems are based on our practices with um, traditional knowledge and uh, all this knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. As indigenous peoples, we have decided to uh, participate in this journey towards a food systems summit to give visibility to the values uh, of our food systems. These are systems that are based on a sacred uh, relationship, one of solidarity with the Mother Earth. Uh, this holy and sacred relationship with Mother Earth and nature has enabled us uh, to build a consensus, a gender equity and participation in collective endeavors. These are the values that we all need to espouse desperately in order to develop a post-pandemic world that will be more equitable, fairer, and based on solidarity. These systems can help us develop resilience in the face of the impact of climate change, the loss of biodiversity, and degradation. They can help in biodiversity restoration. They can increase agroecological systems by adopting regenerative agricultural practices. Our leadership and our traditional knowledge can contribute all this. We have come to this event to share the concern that uh, in spite of all these um, 
aspects, i.e., despite everything that we're doing, our right uh, to healthy foods has uh, been constantly violated and challenged. Uh, land grabbing, the grabbing of our resources and territory, um, racism and the violation of our very rights had led many communities to um, losing control over their lands and food sovereignty, thus suffering from significant levels of poverty and malnutrition. Industrialized agricultural systems have also altered the lifestyle of our peoples. Before these threats, we have worked right by side, right by the side of Agnes, the Special Envoy, FAO, and EFAD, and we have developed a series of recommendations that are the result of over 30 global and independent dialogues in the seven sociocultural regions of the world. We have worked to develop a document with FAO, which is beginning an interscientific dialogue with the scientific committee. And uh, we've also developed a survey in which we tried to reflect the point of view of almost four million indigenous peoples of all regions of the world. And uh, it is for this reason that at this pre-summit, we would like to propose that if we advocate for our food systems, for food security, then what we need to do is to work together. We need to work together with our respective governments, and we need to work together with the UN agencies according to a mechanism that will cover and protect the traditional food systems of indigenous peoples. We want our traditional knowledge and our traditions to be respected. We want to have the capacity to innovate and to create together knowledge that will help us to work towards sustainable systems. We also need that in every fara our rights are respected as established in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, especially the right to our land, the right to um, resources, and the right to government, which is a necessary condition in order for all the other rights to be fulfilled. So we encourage you to work together with us so that the Zero Hunger Fund has a special trust fund component that will be administered by indigenous peoples. And we commit to monitoring together all of the results and outcomes that will issue from this summit process. We are completely in agreement when it comes to the establishment of a platform that will monitor the situation every couple of years, as well as a mechanism that will make it possible to interact, especially with the Rome-based UN agencies. We want to be part of the solution, provided that everyone respect our contributions and provided that we are fully included in decision-making processes at all levels. We are aware of the fact that if we do not make significant and radical changes now, our survival together with that of everybody else is at stake. We must all recognize that our future generations depend on the commitments that we will make an honor together now without leaving anyone behind. Thank you very much. It's so important what you just told us. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so embarrassed to interrupt this kind of discussion because it's so important and this kind of sharing of experience and visions is exactly what is needed to move forward. 
But let me just ask uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, to help me in this reflection, because now the, the point, the key point here is also what the government leadership can do. And so uh, I'm going to ask him, uh, who's a well-known uh, well advisor, to uh, point out what can be done now in terms of leadership. Thank you very much. What we've been hearing is uh, how the system actually works right now. And I want to emphasize, we have a world food system. It's based on large multinational companies. It's based on private uh, profits. It's based on a very, very low measure of international transfers to help poor people, sometimes none at all. It's based on extreme irresponsibility of powerful countries with regard to the environment. And it's based on a radical denial of rights of poor people, as we just heard. It's interesting, we ask, we heard from the minister of DRC, What's wrong with your country? Well, we don't even start by saying the King of Belgium created a slave colony for 30 years. The government of Belgium ran the slave colony for another 40 years. The CIA assassinated your first popular leader, Mr. Lumumba, and then installed another dictatorship for the next 30 years. And then Glencore and others now suck out your cobalt without giving you tax income. We don't reflect on that. We say, what's wrong with you? Why don't you govern properly? And so we have a system, but we need a different system. <laughs> we cannot turn this over to the private sector. We already did about 100 years ago not only to the private sector, to the private sector with the U.S. military behind it. With the defense of these property rights in Mr. the Minister of Honduras's country, where United Fruit ran the country for a long time. And their attorney was the foreign minister of the United States, Secretary Dulles, and his brother was the head of the CIA and overthrew the next door neighbor, Mr. Arbenz, to make sure that United Fruit could have its property. So we have a system, but we need a different system. And the different system has to be based on principles of human dignity in the Universal Declaration, principles of sovereignty, principles of economic rights, because these are not nice things to do in 1948, all the government said that food is a right, social protection is a right, not a nice thing, not a pleasant thing, a right. That was 73 years ago. The SDGs are nothing more than our generation's attempt to honor the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I come from a country that not only doesn't care about the world's poor, it doesn't even care about its own poor. One in seven Americans is hungry right now. And they don't care. I mean, the, the poor people care, but one political party, all it cares about is cutting taxes for the rich and filibustering any solution. So we're in a world that's really tough. The private sector is not going to solve this problem. I'm sorry to say to all of the private sector leaders, Behave, pay your taxes, follow the rules. That's what you should do. And what the governments should do is the following. They won't, but they should. First, the G20 should become the G21 by inviting systemically the chairperson of the African Union and the African Union to be the 21st country. The, 20, the European Union is a member of the G20 as the EU. If you add the AU as the 21st for the G21, you add 1.4 billion people to representation at that crucial 
event. That will change decisively the discussion because 1.4 billion people are not at the table for finance right now, and they need to be. So my first recommendation is the G21. I love the G20. Add one seat, 1.4 billion people with the AU represented. Second, we need a order of magnitude change of development finance. The rich countries just borrowed $17 trillion for COVID. The poor countries, nothing. Because the rich countries can borrow at zero and the poor countries pay five or 10% coupon rates or have no access at all. So the world exposed its grotesque inequality this past year and a half. Rich countries didn't say, we tighten our belts, why don't you? My country spent $7 trillion of emergency funding, not one penny for anybody else, by the way. Seven trillion, it didn't even cross the imagination of the US Congress to include a few crumbs for the rest of the world. But the poor countries cannot borrow. That's what we should have heard from the World Bank. I didn't hear that from the World Bank. I didn't hear real numbers. Real numbers are in trillions right now because the world economy is 100 trillion a year. But we don't talk about real numbers. But my job, all I know in this world is long division. Divide by 100 trillion and then see whether you're talking about something real or not. So that's the second thing. We need massively to increase the lending and borrowing capacity of poor countries at near zero interest rates like the rich countries have. Then they could get something done. By the way, for COVID vaccines, what we really need is for the United States to sit down with China, with Russia, with the European Union and the UK one day around the table and allocate these vaccines rather than hoarding them. That's all it would take. And then we're going to have national pathways. This is a wonderful idea, but they're going to need financing. And so everything that I've been saying, I know the numbers. That's all I do for 40 years is add up what's missing. You want electricity? It has to be purchased. You want digital access? It has to be purchased. You want safe water irrigation? It has to be purchased. This is what I do for a living is add up these numbers and then find out that then somebody makes up something and names one hundredth of what's really needed. It's not even hard. By the way, the IMF has done wonderful studies in the last two years showing that we have a financing gap of about 400 to 500 billion dollars a year for the basics for the SDGs. They show the gap, but they don't, nobody comes up with the number, the solution, which wouldn't be so hard because that's just not a big number. It's 0.5 of 1% of world output. So if we really care, we wouldn't have the G7 saying, we love education, therefore we're gonna give $3 billion for education. That's what they said at the summit. But what UNESCO has shown is that you need at least $30 billion a year, minimum. But nobody looks at numbers. They just make up nice check the box. So we need the real numbers of finance to back the national pathways. The final thing is we need the UN as the core and central institution of this world, period. Because this is the only way we're gonna have a civilized world is a strong UN, and it cannot be that the whole UN budget is less than my neighborhood's budget in New York. The UN core budget this year is $3 billion. New York City's budget is $100 billion. And then we say, why don't things work well? Because the rich are hoarding everything. Final point, rather than our three billionaires going in space, well, they could go into space and stay there and leave their money behind. That would be one idea. Uh, uh. <laughs>
But another yes. idea, another idea is we have 2,775 billionaires on the current list. Their combined net worth, 2,700, is $13.1 trillion. Now, I have it on good authority. You don't need more than a billion dollars to be comfortable. But they have an excess of $11 trillion over just the one billion. So we should be taxing that and having a civilized world. Thank you. Jeffrey Sachs. This was Jeffrey Sachs setting the tone. And uh, uh, now the floor for the closing remarks of this very interesting discussion to Agnes Kalibata, who's the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for the Food System Summit. This has been very exciting. How do I get to talk after Jeff, after such energy without pulling you all down? <laughs> I want to bring out two things in this meeting that we just had, mostly because this is about the conveners that are here. This is about the member states that are here. This, are, this is about the dialogues that we just had and how we can make them useful. See. I used to be Minister of Agriculture once. And <laughs> being Minister of Agriculture is like being one of those, at least in Africa, right? <laughs> it's like being one of, it's, you know, those sectors that not, not trendy, not sexy, you know? Out there, who wants to talk about agriculture? <laughs> what this, these dialogues have done for us, listening to these young ladies say, talk, it's brought the agricultural sector into the conversation of the sexy sectors. The Ministry of Health, right, madam? The Ministry of Health is sitting with the agricultural sector and they're having a conversation. The Ministries of Trade are having conversations with the agricultural sector. And I could go on and on and on. So the opportunities here, ministers of agriculture in this room, the opportunity is here not to feel alone in that sector, struggling with poor farmers. Seven in every ten of them are poor, but of, of us are poor farmers. The opportunity is here to take advantage of the conversation that is happening. In my government, we made a decision one time to put five ministries together to deal with malnutrition and go read the Global Hunger Report of 2012. In three years alone, we were able to bring malnutrition down by 50%. Because there were so many low-hanging fruits that if we worked together, we could immediately bring down. Yes, the hard stuff stay, and you keep working at it. But the easy stuff, we bring down by talking to each other, by coordinating properly, by engaging every day. And this is what these dialogues, if nobody puts money on the table, you still have it in you to deliver something. You still have the ability to, put, to pull down the low-hanging fruits and make sure that we, we move forward. So I just wanted to give you encouragement and to really tell you that this must be the beginning, not the end. This must be how we move forward, talking to each other, engaging, collaborating, pulling down what we can, and then leaving the hard stuff to find the resources. And let's keep challenging everyone to find the resources. Because this is a shared goal. This is a, we started with a shared vision in the morning. I tell you one thing for sure. None of us will survive this unless all of us survive it. So we are going to have to put together. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this message. Thanks for telling us that we will all survive together. And these dialogues are a great part of this story. Thank you, everybody. Now we have a small break, and uh, we will be back by at 6 o'clock for a one-to-one -one meeting with the uh, Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed. Thank you very much. <laughs>